Welcome to the Language Games Podcast. My name is John Kaus. Today is part three of our series on whether John Frame is a Vantillian. We wrap up this series today by looking at Frame's views on traditional apologetical arguments and how he understands the circularity in Van Til's apologetic. So the, the traditional argument, what does Frame think of this? Well, he thinks that the traditional argument is really not that far apart than Van Til's apologetic. He says, in that sense, a proper causal or historical argument does not go uh, beyond scripture. It simply shows the applicability of scriptural truth to some area of the world, and thus it displays the Bible in its full meaning. Okay, but what does that even mean? Are we talking about the scriptural truth probably being applicable, applicable to some area of the world, or certainly being applicable to some area of the world? All causal and historical arguments are presented in a probabilistic way. It is embedded in the heart of the argument. This does not display, then, the Bible in its full meaning, actually just the opposite. He goes on, he says, Our job is to present the Bible as it is, and to do so we must often refer to it in various contexts. Okay, like what contexts? Are they all probabilistic? Are they all evidential? Yes, they have to be. That's what these arguments are. They're evidential, probabilistic arguments. Well, then they're not biblical. This is not the biblical context. Biblically, possibility is defined in relation to God's being and his will. So he is back of possibility. God does not exist in some possible worlds and maybe not others. He's not in the possible. He determines what's possible. All evidential arguments... All of them are committed to a context where possibility uh, is defined in a way separate from God. God possibly exists, and he possibly doesn't exist. It is an unbiblical view of possibility and therefore probability in our argument. So there's no way to combine these two. Again, Frame, because he wants to combine these two schools of thought, really just can not even say glosses over, he just avoids these these conflicts and presents it in a very broad way to try to show, I think just because this is what he wants to be true, that we can bring these two schools together. But the truth is you cannot. You cannot bring these two schools together. But this makes it confusing then for someone who is wanting to be a Vantillian and reads Frame's books and then thinks, oh, and I, I can kind of be evidential too and, and bring this stuff together, when really you can't. You're just being inconsistent at that point. All right, let's move on now to his view on circularity. So Van Til's circularity, what does Frame think of this? Well, let's see. So in circularity, right, we're, we're making an inference, and we are going to a conclusion, and it's circular in the narrow sense if the conclusion, if we already started with the conclusion. So if we're, if where we're going, we, we st if we're starting from... Uh, if we're starting with our conclusion, then we're narrowly circular. And it doesn't matter where you hide the conclusion. Okay, so you could start with three, four premises, and one of them is the conclusion. That's still just as narrowly circular as if you, if you just had the conclusion to start with. And you could have, you know, 20 premises. You could have 100 premises. You could have 1,000 premises. But if even one of them has the conclusion, it's narrowly circular. And all the other premises don't matter. It is just as narrowly circular as, as, the, as the argument that only has one premise, it being the conclusion. You just, you're just hiding the circularity. So again, having the conclusion present at the beginning is the problem. And we call this formally circular, narrowly circular, viciously circular. It's all the same kind of, kind of argument. All right, now Frame talks about this. He says, in the fifth place, I have in DKG, or Doctrine of the Knowledge of God, and elsewhere, distinguished between narrowly circular and broadly circular arguments. An example of the former would be, the Bible is the word of God because it is the word of God. He writes, I agree with any non-presuppositionalist that this narrowly circular argument is not an apologetic claim in a serious sense. In fact, it acts as a contrast to those arguments that I believe have real apologetic value. Okay, hold on to that, right? So he, he agrees that narrowly circular arguments have no apologetic value. They are in contrast to ones that have real value. And I agree with that completely, and so would Bonson, and so would Van Til. Van Til's argument is not narrowly circular. All right, now Frames, though, is going to try to tell us 
how, it, how it's different, right? How it goes beyond this narrow circularity. And he uses uh, the broad argument. He says, okay, this broad circularity, right? He's going to address that. He goes, the broad argument says, the Bible is the word of God because of various evidences. And then it specifies those evidences. Okay, but how is that circular in the broad sense? Surely he does not mean arguments as traditionally presented by evidentialists, which are not circular in any sense of that term. They are unsound, of course, but they are, they are not circular. They do not have the conclusion somewhere hidden in the premises. Yet Frame's description here of the broad circularity would fit these arguments. So this is not a meaningful uh, description of broad circularity. All right, so what happens then Let's just run with this for a little bit. What happens if we drill down into these various evidences? Do we find the conclusion there all along? Surprisingly, Frame does not give us more on this point. He does not explain at all how appealing to these various evidences is broadly circular. Now, I cannot confirm this since Frame does not give us enough to go on, but given his discussion of circular arguments later in the book, it seems that he takes broadly circular arguments to be ones that contain the circularity in a more hidden way. So when we looked at having the conclusion hidden, you know, amongst 20 or 30 or 100 other premises, right, if, it's, if you bury it deep enough, then it's broadly circular. I think that's what he's actually getting at. So he says, we appeal to various evidences, which are really just resting on the conclusion, again, though, in a hidden way in the sub-premises. And of course, this is, narrow, this is just as narrowly circular as the Bible is true because the Bible is true. Okay, now it seems then that Frame does not understand what he means by this term, broad circularity. As we move on in the book, we also see him say very puzzling things about what it means for an argument to be absolutely certain, which further corroborates his confusion on circularity. He writes, he's going to give this argument. It says, premise one, what scripture says is always true. Premise two, scripture says that God exists. Conclusion, therefore God exists. In one sense, he's, he writes, in one sense then, this argument is one form of absolutely certain proof for the existence of God. Really, the first premise says what scripture says is always true, clearly is as already assuming that God exists. The conclusion is assumed in the premise, in premise one, which again, this, this gives evidence to, I think, frames understanding a broad circularity is just a hidden circularity. But he doesn't understand that these are, this is actually just narrow circularity, which again is problematic and unfortunate. And he, but he admits that this argument is narrowly circular. He says, the argument in question is narrowly circular because the first premise is so clearly dependent on the conclusion. Okay, so the argument doesn't work. It's of no real apologetic value then, which you said earlier of narrow, narrowly circular arguments. How is this then, in any sense, an absolutely certain proof? It isn't. It is the assumption that God exists, therefore, God exists. That's it. It is nothing different than hiding the conclusion with all of these premises. All right. Now, let's, go, let's, let's end this now in going to the, the last half of the quote we, we were just reading which again exposes, I don't think Frame understands what circularity even is in, in argumentation. Like he understands narrow circularity in a sense, but when he's actually going through why it's wrong, he starts to make all of these weird statements, which conflict with each other. Like, oh, narrowly circular arguments have no apologetical value, but then all of a sudden, you know, they do. In a sense, they're, you know, an absolute, absolutely certain proof, which they're not. And then he says this odd comment about valid deductive syllogisms. He says, of course, all valid deductive syllogisms, and really he just means all valid arguments, are circular in the sense that the conclusion is already implicit in the premises. Let me read that again. He says, of course, all valid deductive syllogisms are circular in the sense that the conclusion is already implicit in the premises. In what sense are all valid deductive arguments circular? He, again, he doesn't tell us. He just says this. He doesn't unpack what this actually means. Okay, but he's, he's introduced previously two notions of circularity. One was narrow circularity, which all valid deductive arguments clearly are not. So, but, but then we show, though, when he talks about broad circularity, 
it really is just a hidden narrow circularity. So he, I think, is claiming here that all valid deductive arguments are narrowly circular, but they're clearly not. So here be an example of an inference. We have P, and then we conclude P. P, therefore P. Another argument would be we have P, we also have if P then Q, and then we conclude we infer Q. The top one is a narrow circularity. We start with P, we get P, right? We start with where we're trying to go. The bottom one is modus ponens, a standard and probably the most fundamental form of inference that we have. P is one premise. If P then Q is a second premise, we infer Q. But notice Q is not present in P and if P then Q. We can get Q from the premises, of course. That's the inference. But this is not narrowly circular. How this is circular, I have no idea. And Frame, I don't think, has any idea either. All right, so all valid deductive arguments are not narrowly circular. And so what do we make of this? What do we make of Frame saying this? I think this lines up with what I suspect was going on when Frame talks about merging these two schools of thought, and that is he just doesn't understand how it's working formally. He doesn't understand how the assumptions are functioning. He doesn't understand, in short, Van Til's apologetic. He does not understand it. And this would explain then why he can so quickly go to trying to bring the two, two schools together because he doesn't, doesn't really understand the difference. Now, this is sad given that this book that we went through is an updated, ver I mean, updated version of a book Frame you know, wrote in the, in the 90s. He's had 30 years to work through these issues. There's really no excuse for his treatment of Van Til to be of this quality, and there's no excuse for people calling him a Vantillian. He is clearly not a Vantillian. All right, we'll stop there. More could be said you know, about Frame's work on apologetics, uh, but this series is just touching on the main issues as they relate to Vantill's apologetic. And I don't really like doing these kinds of series because I don't want to just, you know, <laughs> in a sense, cut into a, a brother in, in his work. I'm not cutting into him personally, just in his work. But this is so... Uh, prevalent in apologetical circles that are Vantillian. This confusion is out there all over the place, and it's had decades to get corrected, and it has not been corrected. So I think it's fair to at least have uh, a critique of it in, in addressing it. All right, but we'll move on from this. In the next series, we're going to turn to the topic of eschatology and see whether we should be hopeful in doing apologetics. For more content like this, you can find us on x at underscore language games. See you next time.